Bears. Libertarians. Guns. Llamas. Shipping containers. Donuts, buckets of them. Sheep. Bum fights. Tabasco sauce. Cayenne, Cayenne peppers. pepper. Sorry. Yeah. What do all these have to do with each other? Well, we're going to find out. Today we brought on Matthew. We never asked him how to say his name. Hongoltz Hetling. So it's got two last names. Hongoltz Hetling. So there was a fascinating article done about this story. I think it was based on this book that, uh, that Matthew wrote called A Libertarian Walks Into a Bear. It's about a small town where libertarian, libertarians decided they were going to take over, but they all surrounded this issue of bears taking over at the same time and like who wins, who gets the town, bears or libertarians. And bears are more centralized, I think. They have more of a government infrastructure. Yeah. Gives them more power. Well, aren't they all connected? Because they're by all of one mind. mind. Yeah. Well, the truth about bears is there actually isn't, it, it's kind of a myth that there's bears. There's just, there's like a god bear god and then it kind of disperses into smaller. Yeah. There might be multiple that, but they're too big to fit on one planet. So anyway, so that's why they can all think the same yeah. combined. Anyway, it's like the Borg from Star Wars. I guess I don't watch that. I only do <laughs> nonfiction. <laughs> oh, is that? <laughs> I didn't even get that that was a joke. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to catch it. <laughs> Sounds like that'd be on Star Wars. A thing <laughs> called the Borg. Anyway, it was a fun co- conversation because, you know, it's, uh, we had a, He's a journalist. He's a typical journalist, left-leaning Democrat guy, but he was a really jovial, fun, nice guy. He, he, he was weirdly obsessed with what our address was. Yeah, he asked us where we were. He's like trying to <laughs> dox us. I, I don't know. It was strange. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not true. But uh, no, it was good. Yeah, it was, a lo- it was a lot of fun. There's some fun stuff in the... Uh, well, he has a great story about a llama fighting a bear, so make sure you get that, and then there's some great stuff in the subscriber portion, too. Got a little moving. It did. It got a little end. touching at the very end there. People from different sides of the political divide, like just reaching, yeah. boop, and booping each other. Unpolarizing. Yep. So if you want to see us booping each other, trying to find like a polar bear. Check out this interview. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't, anyway, I couldn't find it. Check it out. Let's do it. Well, thanks for coming on, Matthew. This is going to be a fun talk. Bears, libertarians, donuts, firecrackers, garbage, <laughs> donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I saw your book on, I think, well, okay, so I I made a book about bears, so we have that in common. Um, and so after doing that, I now get sent every bear thing that ever gets made ever on the internet <laughs> multiple times. So I had been sent, when your uh, book came out, I got sent links to the story at least a few times. And then, uh, you know, I kind of perused the, the, I perused it and I was like, libertarians and bears this could be good this could be good content for the babylon b because uh kyle is a now i don't know if kyle calls himself libertarian i've always i've started to think of myself as leaning more libertarian but uh i love the uh the challenge of what do libertarians do when they start a little town and bears take over and i, I wanted to see kyle squirm a little bit <laughs> I'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, how nutty. Like, uh, we're, we're in the club of bear book authors. Yeah. Uh, that, that's yeah. a pretty exclusive uh, uh, set of the Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> do you get sent lots of bear stuff now, too? Uh, I do, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah, uh, there was like an XC... What, what, what's the name of the uh, the comic? The XKCD. That, XKCD, yeah. that's it, that's it. Uh, one of those was bear themed recently. Um, uh, yeah, pe- people are always uh, kind of driving that digital traffic toward me. <laughs> and also, uh, before we get into it, I just want to say what a big fan I am of Axe Cop. I know that's oh, probably thank you, sir. feeling pretty far in your rear view mirror. <laughs> um, that was uh, how I first heard of you and your work. And uh, what, what, what a delightful premise. <laughs> Thanks so much. Do you I know that he did Bear Mageddon also? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where bears take over the world. It's kind of like your story, but like worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's a libertarian and bears mm-hmm. kill them all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Bear Mageddon, are they all black bears or uh, do, do, do you. Uh... Mostly grizzly. I, I like the grizzly because they're this, the scariest yeah. of the bears. Yeah, the big giant brown ones. All right. So, how about uh, give us the rundown on just the story of your book so we can kind of just jump in from. What is the, 
you know, obviously you can't read the whole book out loud to us, but <laughs> well, I could, you could, we got time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so basically, uh, the book is called a libertarian, uh, walks into a bear. Um, and it is about this kind of utopian social experiment that a kind of splinter fragment of the libertarian community tried to do in this little town in, uh, called Grafton, New Hampshire. Uh, so, you know, uh, the libertarian community is pretty loosely affiliated, um, in part just because of uh, the DNA of the philosophy, I think, uh, that they don't tend to march in lockstep. Um, but this idea kind of got bandied around um, uh, by Jason Sorens, who you will know is the founder of the Free State Project, just kind of like this idea that, like, if libertarians could concentrate their voting power, uh, they could change a place in the United States to uh, be kind of like an example and a showcase of libertarian values in action. Uh, hmm. Because as you guys know, there's no libertarian states, there's no libertarian countries. Um, uh, so it, it can be kind of hard to see what uh, a pure libertarian philosophy means in practice. Hmm. Um, and, and so they decided to go to this small town, um, you know, a, a small group of libertarians and begin what they called the Freetown Project. And so kind of like in their mind, they were, you know, founding fathers or liberators. Uh, they, they came to this town and, um, invited libertarians from around the country to come to Grafton. And then they worked to change the culture and the rules in the town to kind of do away with as many taxes as they could do away with as many rules and regulations as they could. Um, and kind of just like assert uh, their individual uh, rights and freedoms at every turn. So it's kind of like, like libertarian Chaz. <laughs> Except for It'd be like Naz, New Hampshire autonomous zone, right? <laughs> Naz. Naz. <laughs> <laughs> Is that or a rapper? Grafton, well, Grafton autonomous zone, Gaz. Gaz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean every every philosophy has its kind of like uh fringe extreme members, right? Mm -hmm. And so and those that are the ones you, ones you want building a society, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, basically, if you say, like, hey, I'm building a utopian town, uh, who's with me? The folks who show up yeah. on your doorstep the next week are the folks yeah. who are, you know, pretty unmoored. Yeah, Crazy Larry. <laughs> and, like, cockeyed <laughs> Connie. I don't know, I don't yeah. know, nutty yeah. people. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah. Do you guys know uh, Zach Bass? Uh, well, when you said Crazy Larry, it reminded me of him because uh, Zach Bass is a pseudonym for his actual name of uh, oh, Larry Pendarvis. Mm. My brother has a cat named Crazy Larry. <laughs> That's where I got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Zach Bass, um, he was like a mail order bride business owner mm. uh, who was one of these founding fathers. And he came in and he kind of like stated their goals in these really extreme terms. You know, he, mm. he wanted, he set up a website that was like, you know, we are going to uh, 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 assert our right to traffic drugs and organs and um, make sure that we can support bum fights and you know uh, <laughs> all the big important stances <laughs> all, all, all the important issues right 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 uh so yeah the, the people of grafton kind of like flipped out because you know they, they were like yeah go build your own town uh the, this is this is our town well you know, how dare you build your utopia in my face um and yet over a period of about 12 to 14 years, they were really able to have a very strong influence on the culture and the structure of this town. Um, so what my book talks about is kind of like that social experiment and how uh, several years in, it, uh, the town started seeing really unusual bear activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and... and uh, <laughs> My book makes the case for why this particular Bear Mageddon uh, is connected to um, the, the Freetown Project. All right, so Freetown Project—I've never heard of it. 
I know about is that connected free to free state? project. Is it like is an offshoot? It is very emphatically not connected to the the free state project. Uh-huh, okay. Like um, basically, the free state project, uh, you know, sent them messages like, "Get the hell out of New Hampshire. You guys are, are kind of like Flower get up. Can I swear on your show? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. As much as get, you want. It gets bleeped it in gets a bleeped funny way, and it's funny. People don't, like don't it. piss in our water. You yeah. guys turn up for us. Um, uh, you're, you're just, you know, you're so out there. Uh, you, you don't want to, you know, we don't want you representing us because, uh, as you know, the free state project, you know, they have some fairly, uh, uh, you know, as extreme as the libertarian philosophy can be like they're organized, they have a budget, they have funding, you know, they're really like trying to do something. They have timelines and plans, uh, that they're fairly well thought out, um, these guys were just coming in and telling a town like, Hey, no, this is our town now. Hmm. They're like, like the Raj Nishis of libertarians. I keep <laughs> trying to find a good analogy. <laughs> Remember antelope? Yeah. Sure. The Raj Nishi cult. They try to take over antelope, oh, poison the water supply. Yeah, come on. Wild, wild country, Netflix. Come on. He knows. No idea. He's educated. It's no the, idea. Uh, it's the Tiger King of the Libertarian movement. <laughs> yeah. that, that's a reference we'll, we'll all get. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no. Uh, so they came in and they started trying to implement these rules and regulations or, you know, do away with rules and regulations. And so, you know, they basically throttled the municipal taxes and municipal services as much as they possibly could. Uh, and meanwhile, one of the reasons that they came to Grafton in the first place was that Grafton had a long history of like anti-tax sentiment, and they also had no zoning. Uh, so that meant that as the free towners came in, they could buy a lot of land for cheap and then set up kind of like whatever sort of living situation they might want. So they were living in yurts and tents and shipping containers and cabins <laughs> and, uh, and kind of like this ragged assortment of camps of almost exclusively uh, armed white men just started to kind of like grow magically in the woods. Well, this sounds fantastic so far. (laughs) (laughs) This is uh, the modern Thoreau. Um, (laughs) Did they have bags of Sprite? Like Chaz? Chaz had bags of Sprite and that really gave them a leg up. Mm. (laughs) So... um, (laughs) So they uh, successfully build a bunch of these uh, oddball places in the woods. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are cutting town services. Uh, you know, Grafton had like one uh, full-time law enforcement officer, the, the police chief, who was voted in every year, right? So mm-hmm. it was like an elected position. And he had to get up at town meeting and say that he hadn't been able to uh, do his job effectively for a couple of months because his only cruiser uh, had badly needed repairs and he couldn't afford to make it safe for the road. <laughs> Some of the other impacts were uh, they shut off their street lights because uh, they didn't want to pay for electricity bills. Mm. Uh, dramatically cut back on road maintenance. Um uh, so that, you know, like potholes kind of got out of control very quickly. Uh, and this wasn't like a big community in the first place. They only had like a thousand people mm-hmm. and uh, they always kind of go uh, thrifty. That, that's kind of like the New England Yankee mentality anyway. Uh, so it wasn't like there was all sorts of uh, money that they had to like stop the expenditure up. Can you hear my cat? I can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it bear or? Sounds like your cat's... Um, yeah. Defending this libertarian cat, values. Twenty years old. This cat. Wow. <laughs> this is my ancient cat. <laughs> hey, hi, kitty. Hi. Hello, kitty. <laughs> so the bears show up. We gotta so, get to the bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So basically, uh, when you have a bunch of oddball living situations in the woods, each one of which is managing its own food in its own way and each is managing its um sewage and food waste in its own way Mm -hmm. and each is dealing with bears in their own way what you're basically saying to bears is 
every place is a puzzle. And if you unlock this puzzle, you will get the caloric reward, right? So the bears um, looked at it and thought, we could make our own Chaz. <laughs> Here. Baz. Baz. <laughs> <laughs> so they just saw a buffet it's, yeah it's like a golden corral opened up in the middle of new hampshire so you had some people that were shooting them some people were feeding them some people were yeah 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 uh yeah like in addition to like the unintentional feeding that like uh non-standardized food storage systems uh created um they had all sorts of uh, folks who were kind of asserting their right to feed the bears. Mm. Uh, so mm. just for kind of like the pleasure of watching them eat. Uh, so there's one anecdote in the book about two elderly women who live side by side, their neighbors on like a wooded hillside. And one of them, when the bears start to get out of control, is completely terrified. And she's like, she won't leave her house without doing a bear check. Um, she's like, hearing noises in the night at the front door and thinks it might be a bear and like getting her gun and going to like check it out. Uh, she's, uh, when she cooks meat, she won't leave the house for several hours cause she doesn't want to smell like meat and therefore tempt the bears. <laughs> Meanwhile, her neighbor has been feeding the bears for like 10 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and her neighbor, uh, who wants to remain anonymous, we, we call her donut lady. Uh, establish this routine where every day, twice a day, she would go out with two full buckets of grain topped by a pile of sugared donuts. And she would kind of like totter out there and there would be, uh, Ethan, do you know what a, a, a group of bears is called being a bear book author? Oh, man. Yes, I do. But I'm blanking on it right now. A sleuth. What's that? Oh, sleuth. Yeah, uh, sleuth. <laughs> that's right so are you even a bear expert man no it's been a while <laughs> I'm working on their stuff there's a sleuth of bears waiting outside donut lady's house oh wait how does she come up with all those donuts every day twice a day a bucket of donuts yeah she wouldn't tell me how much she was spending she's like willy wonka or something like she must have some <laughs> magic donut factory that's crazy someone told me like yeah like uh she, she would like back up her truck to like the local grain supply store and just yeah like load it in that was the only way she could keep pace with the demands so she saw herself as the snow white of bears <laughs> yeah. sing a little song and the little woodland creatures would come and think, but it's all bears but it's just bears <laughs> so it really showed me how like two people can live like side by side with totally alternate realities and perceptions of the same exact phenomenon of yeah. a bunch of bears, right? Like one woman was living in the fairy tale, the Snow White uh, story. The other was living in like some horrific wilderness-based horror movie. Like Misery or something. <laughs> yeah, Misery, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the timeline here, it took them like 10 years, like they took over the town and then yeah, there was like a decade of, because you said feed them for 10 years. Yeah. Um, like, is she one of the people that came to the town as a libertarian? No, she was not a free town herself. You know, she would probably describe herself as libertarian leaning. She's probably a commie. <laughs> but she was just one of of several uh, uh, folks who were feeding them. Some of them okay. were the free towners. She was kind of like the longest standing and maybe most famous example in, in the town because she just had such a, a pack of admirers uh, in, in the bears. And like, she was literally like within, you know, like she could touch them. Like they would crowd, wow. you know, like a dog crowds you to be fed. Yeah. You would bring out its inner dish. You know, she was like, you know, like go away, go away. Mm -hmm. uh, just to clear a little space for her to be able to set their food down. Wow. And like how many bears would show up? Um, I, I, one woman told me that like when she drove by the house and she looked back down into the yard, like it was just like thick with bear. Um, Thick with bear. You don't even use the plural at that point. <laughs> they yeah. do. They are yeah. able to meld into each other and become one giant, like kind of bear loaf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was the bear collective. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll guess, you know, something like uh, eight, eight to 12. Wow. Uh, and they didn't even hibernate because they didn't have to hibernate uh, through the winter because they had donuts on tap. Wow. She, wow. She messed up their circadian rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Wow. Donuts. 
Yeah. So, um, and also kind of like exacerbating the problem as the libertarians uh, and the Freetowners did not kind of truck with government. Uh, they tended not to take advantage of the state fishing game, like wildlife conflict resolution process. So like ordinarily, if there's a bear that gets a little uh, clawsy, uh, you can call fishing game. <laughs> uh, and they'll come and uh you know kind of like assess what's going on and if there really is a problem there they will make the call to either kill or trap it mm -hmm. uh, but in this case those those folks weren't getting called or you know maybe that uh warden will tell the neighbor hey stop putting out bird seed you know you're attracting the bears or, or whatever mm -hmm. whatever the human source might be uh so bears just got nuts in this town um and even though the state of new hampshire had not had a bear attack in probably 150 years leading up to the Freetown project. Um, since the Freetown project began, uh, there have been three bear attacks all clustered in this Grafton area. Uh, the first one uh, right in Grafton and then the subsequent two in uh, towns that kind of neighbor Grafton that are within a, a bear's territory of Grafton. A bear's throw. <laughs> Something, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how far can a bear throw is the question. Mm. So <laughs> when did you hear about this? And I, I see you you wrote something about cats going missing and this bear comes and takes kittens away from a lady and you had heard yeah. about this. And th is that what tipped you off to this? And, and why don't you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, I was just like a small town reporter working for my daily uh, newspaper, a uh, support local independent journalism. It's important. Um, and... They um, they sent me to do this story about a Vietnam War era veteran named Jessica Soul, and Jessica was having a hard time getting the VA to um, uh, make her house accessible. So she kind of like couldn't really safely access her own bathroom or her own upstairs, and she was in this like uh, protracted disagreement with the VA trying to resolve that. Uh, so I went to her house uh, to interview her about that issue. And she had a bunch of cats. Uh, so I was kind of like chit-chatting about the cats. And uh, she says, oh, yeah, uh, I used to let them outside, but that was before the bears came. <laughs> Thunder. Who cares about the VA? Tell me about the bears. I've, I, I've never heard that particular you know, arrangement of words before. Uh, <laughs> Just as an aside, like mm. totally burying the lead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, before the bears came and attacked the entire town. Yeah, you know, this VA thing. It's like you're, you're, um, you're interviewing someone about like cheese or something yeah. and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, but uh, that, it keeps the aliens away. Yeah. You know, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so that got me asking questions about bears. Uh, and so I started talking to her neighbor. Oh, and actually she'd have like this horrific... A uh, series of encounters with bears where the first one was the one that you mentioned and alluded to uh, She's like out on a picnic table in her backyard and a bear comes breaking out of the uh, Underbrush just a few feet from her <laughs> snatches up two of her kittens and eats them like in front of her Oh my gosh uh, <laughs> Didn't go for the picnic basket <laughs> it did, did not want the picnic basket. Maybe it was coming for her and like lost its nerve. I don't know um <laughs> But uh, my, my editor asked me to remove a, uh, a sentence in the book, which I did, uh, but I'll share it with you guys. Oh, right. yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing, but it was something to the extent of uh, she couldn't say for sure whether the cracking of bones ended before or uh, whether the mewling kittens, the sound of the kittens mewling ended before the cracking of bones began. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're okay with you keeping in the humans being murdered by bears, but not the kittens as much. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Don't get that's too right. graphic with the kittens. <laughs> 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 um, and so, you know, she had, uh, you know, bears trying to force their way into her house at one point. Uh, and she also had this thing where she was, yeah, and she was in a wheelchair, um, uh, related to her, her service. And she, at one point, um, you know, like had to start arming herself to go to her mailbox in her front yard because 
you know, she never knew like when she was going to hit a, an angry bear out there. Hmm. Um, and yeah, so she, she was a character. She was a former, uh, Mooney uh, oh, who no. came to town to start like, a uh, like a summer camp for Moonies in, in that town. Uh, so that, that was, uh, uh, an interesting backstory for her too. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you met some interesting people. So you went to the <laughs> town, you interviewed, how many of the people from yeah. like how many people are still there from this like how did this dismantle and did, how many people from this group did you interview when i got there things were uh it was in 2016 and things were um had kind of like just started to to die down and and uh uh fizzle out um so yeah, i probably interviewed about 50 people from the town and the town only has like 800 to a thousand people in it hmm. Uh, and what happened was the, uh, free state project triggered, you know, and, and, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, but like basically their whole thing was they were going to sign up, uh, I think it was like, uh, 15,000 or 20,000, uh, libertarians across the country. And as soon as, uh, enough of them, as soon as they, uh, hit that goal in, in terms of thousands of people, then the event was triggered and they all had to uh, make good on their pledge to move to the state. And so what that did was you had libertarians from all around the country kind of uh, continuously replenishing the supply of libertarians in Grafton up until that point. But as soon as it was triggered, uh, then libertarians who wanted to you know, go do this kind of like grand social experiment adventure instead of just going to Grafton now could go to you know, virtually any community in New Hampshire and try to work their will on a more statewide level. And so uh, that kind of like took the uh, energy, it, it sapped the energy of the Freetown project uh, because, you know, probably a lot of libertarians looked at Grafton and said, well, why would I want to live there? There's all these bears there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, Kyle went, you went there. Yeah. And I was going to say, you know, you had mentioned the free state project being more organized, probably having more of a legitimacy as an organization. And what struck me was just, you know, there's, there's this great diversity of people and like they had all had different reasons. You know, you had religious people, you had non-religious people, you know, you see people from all different walks of life, but they did kind of have this common goal. And when you were interviewing people for at, at this free town project, it, I mean, was it all, was, were they all there for similar reasons? Were, was there any diversity there? I mean, how did they strike you? Were they like conspiracy theory, survivalist nuts <laughs> or, or just like a wide range of people? I mean, they, they were definitely um, diverse, but what they had in common, you know, like they were diverse in terms of like how they would articulate that, mm -hmm. articulate that reasoning. Uh, some of them, uh, yeah, like had strong faith. Some of them were more interested in like, just like a back to nature type model. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of them were you know, really concerned with like uh, marijuana legalization, you know, that, those sorts of issues, which were still, you know, now, now they're much further along than, than they were then. They should have fed the bears with marijuana donuts. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that would just make them hungrier, right? Yeah, but they would be like <laughs> the chills. They would probably wouldn't be eating kittens. <laughs> <laughs> too much work yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'd just be staring at the kittens <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like the um the liver they, they um uh yeah they, they were definitely like a diverse group but they also like because of that um uh the way they had been kind of like pre-selected you know like, like that idea of people who were just ready to kind of like pick up from wherever they were living and move across the country to this random small town. That was kind of like the, the defining feature was that they all were very kind of like uh, individualistic and, and unmoored. Did many of them have kids? Very few. Okay. I was going to um, yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they, you know, they, they tried unsuccessfully <laughs> to get Grafton to withdraw from the school district, you know, which mm. was a multi-town school district. Uh, they tried to, have the town of Grafton declared a, a United Nations free zone. Mm. <laughs> what is that? 
<laughs> wait, wait. Just, just in case the United Nations was thinking of coming to Grafton. <laughs> <laughs> Their money is no good there. Um, but then, like, uh, somebody in Grafton was, like, pissed at the Freetowners. So he amended the wording in the motion. Well, like, there was, like, a legislative, uh, uh, a town-level legislative motion made to, to declare it a United Nations free zone. And he amended it so that instead the text read um, that the town wanted to make it a uh, SpongeBob SquarePants free zone. <laughs> <laughs> My wife would be on board with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there, there was one character in the book in particular who I'd love to get your take on um, because I know you guys have strong faith, right? Yeah. Ironclad. Ironclad. Ironclad faith. I love it. Um, Untoppable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um there was a guy named john cannell uh who was like a uh uh Mass- massachusetts factory worker you know he worked in like a chemical plant uh he acted heroically during the fire of the chemical plant and developed some health issues as a result because he had inhaled a lot of toxic turnip um and he came as a freetowner uh to grafton and he like cashed in his factory pension and used it to buy this historic building uh, that had traditionally been used as a church. Uh, so it, it was technically called the Grafter Center Center Meeting House uh, because the town was so kind of like anti-tax in general. It didn't want to take that building on as an asset because it, it represented a, a cost. And so this guy came in and was able to buy it for sixty eight thousand dollars. Uh, and it's like a 300 year old, gorgeous, quaint, historic New England church. You know, it's got the peak with a big tower and, and you know, all the pews that had been there for, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if the pews themselves were there for hundreds of years, but like you, you get, this was like a really hallowed, sacred place for the people of Grafton. How quickly was it transformed into a bum fighting arena? <laughs> well, he himself, he was this really interesting character because he had no religious training, uh, but he declared himself to be a pastor of what he called the Peaceful Assembly Church. And he was very, um, very, it was really important to him to like uh, walk the path of peace and, and pacifism. He, he was very into um, but he quickly got himself like, so he held like Sunday services. Um, but again, he didn't have any like formal training. Uh, he would talk some, sometimes he would say that he was like, you know, like speaking directly to God, you know, having mm-hmm. like a back and forth conversation. Um, and he got into this like knockdown drag out years long fight with the town over whether he had to pay taxes on this property. Because he basically mm-hmm. said, I'm a church, I'm, I'm religiously exempt. And the town said, you're not really a church because you're more like a, a, a clubhouse uh, and you don't have any religious credentials. And they said, if you want to be uh, accepted as a church, you have to apply to the IRS for nonprofit status. But because this guy was such a big uh, libertarian, he said, I don't recognize the IRS. I, I refuse to do that on moral grounds. Uh, and so, yeah, there was like this slow building tax bill that he was refusing to address that, uh, had the potential to oust him from the church. Yeah. The town, Mm -hmm. uh, slowly gaining the right to like take over this building. And I just wonder, you know, where do you guys stand like this guy, uh, with his background, uh, you know, he read a lot of philosophy. He read a lot of religious texts, um, you know, do you kind of like accept him as like a, a potential spiritual leader or is he just like, did, do we discount him because he, he didn't have uh, formal training and because a lot of what he did was maybe not in lockstep with traditional mainstream uh, churches? Yeah, I don't know that guy specifically, but I mean, I think you it's probably smart to at least file the IRS paperwork. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and, if they, and if they say thumbs up, then I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, they'll make anything a nonprofit. I mean, the, the lack of formal training is like there's a ton of pastors that don't have formal yeah, training. So, I that. wouldn't say that in specific as like a disqualifier. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it, it sounds a little suspect to me. 
did he live in this church? Like, so he moved to me yeah. at his house, and then he's like, people can come over, and I'll tell them about God. That's right. Oh, That's okay. right. Yeah. Sounds a little suspect. Mm. I am a church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He he got into, like, actually, like, his, his story kind of, like, turned tragic over years because eventually the town put so much heat on him that he came up with this idea that he was going to give the church to a group of libertarians, um, you know, other free towners who could apply to the IRS and go through all the paperwork and all that. And they would allow him to live there indefinitely as the pastor. But he did it on like a handshake deal. Hmm. So they suddenly own the church that he had put his life savings into. And then he got into conflict with them and they did not solve the tax problem and also were doing things that he felt violated kind of like the religious principles that he was adhering to. Like he was a strict pacifist and they were like linking it uh, to the right to bear arms uh, and, you know, uh, uh, doing a lot of like uh, gun themed demonstrations that he was uncomfortable with. Uh, And meanwhile, he was like basically completely out of money because he hadn't made any sort of a long-term plan because uh, yeah, he just believed that God would provide. And just about a month before the town could have taken over the church, uh, and while these new owners were threatening to change the locks and freeze him out, um, the church burned down with him inside it, and, and he died in the fire. Oh, that was unexpected. Um, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, that's not the ending I was expecting here. <laughs> <laughs> And after, you know, uh, uh, and part of the, the appeal for Gratch and Remember was the lack of zoning requirements. So, like, the church didn't have to be uh, fire safe, mm. you know, uh, and it was demonstrably not. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, this beautiful, historic, sacred building built, uh, burned down around his ears. The town lost that asset. He lost his life. And, and uh, you know, I know you don't think this is funny, but you're smiling the whole time you're saying this. <laughs> I think you're just a very smiley guy. <laughs> it's like the t- that's why I didn't see it coming. You're like, and then the burned out with him inside uh, it. The delicious, <laughs> the delicious burning of libertarians. <laughs> I'm very detached from the. Uh, <laughs> I guess. The, yeah, no, no, no. I, yeah, I. It's like the Timothy Meadows guy. You remember him, Grizzly Man? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Herner Herzog thing. Uh, yeah, you know, we can say both that maybe he was sympathetic in some ways, but also uh, did this idiotic thing that resulted in his own death. Sure. Uh, that, that's sure. that's personally how I think of, of Canel. You know, like a uh, nice guy. Did you ever talk to him? Did you interview him? No, he he, he died uh, just before I got okay. there. Hmm. Sad. So who's like the craziest character you talked to in this town? Um, let's see. I mean, most of the... the I suppose one of the libertarians who uh, they, who John Cannell like seated, no, actually, let's see. All right, so the group of libertarians that John Cannell gave the church to appointed a co pastor uh, named John Redman, who also had no official religious training uh, and who was like the, the big. Uh, uh, second amendment rights guy uh he i first met him living in this like oddball camp off in the woods and he came in and i wasn't even there to interview him i was talking to this other guy tom ploge and while i'm talking to tom ploge he's just like uh this guy's name is john redmond he's just inserting himself into the conversation with a lot of really like wacky assertions like uh you know, like, hey, yesterday, uh, you know what I saw? I saw a crow flying upside down. I never saw a bird acting so joyously flying upside down before. <laughs> it's like one of the ones from Dumbo. <laughs> and I'm asking, you know, this other guy, like, yeah, so what does li- being a libertarian mean to you? And, and uh, you know, what, what, have you had any interesting bear encounters? And then he's like, hey, I saw these uh, bird tracks the other day in the woods that were bigger than a man's hand and they weren't turkeys and I don't know what the hell they were. <laughs> uh, and then he like, you know, like slapped a, a, a package of bullets down on my uh, car console at one point because we were interviewing in the car because 
the mobile uh, home that they lived in had some other guy sleeping in there. Um, <laughs> it had bears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he uh, he also like his the the Freetowners all had their own like bear favored bear deterrent methods. So like one guy built booby traps, another guy threw firecrackers at <laughs> Like them. Home Alone with bears? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so this guy's uh, thing was uh, he, when he put out his food garbage, he covered it in cayenne pepper. So that <laughs> <laughs> Tabasco Again, sauce on there? That's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. He said he bought a uh, restaurant-sized bulk container of it. <laughs> I love that the bears are all having to explain, okay, you go to that house, you eat the food, there's covered in cayenne pepper, this one's covered in donuts, so always go, go to this house. Word got around in the bear yeah. community, yeah. <laughs> Is that for the bears that are like into spicy stuff? Spice lords, what do they call them? Guys that like hot stuff? Yeah. Hot wings, guys? Bears? Yeah, the bears, there's a bear expert who lives uh, in New Hampshire named Ben Killam. Uh, and he's uh, kind of <laughs> <your last name. laughs> he was uh, he was kind of like the bear whisperer in that uh, 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 documentary about pandas that came out maybe about a year ago with uh, Kristen Bell narrating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he I, he wrote a couple of books on bears that I read, and he asserts that bears are like so amazingly smart. That, you know, we think of them as these like kind of like solitary, brutish thugs off in the woods. But he says that they are actually smarter than apes. Um, yeah, meaning that like, you know, if, if they had fingers instead of paws, they could do sign language better than Coco the gorilla. Uh, mm-hmm. that, uh, they have, they can count to like 13, uh, that they, they have a real, a lot of gray matter that allow them to like problem solve. Um, and that they even have like a social justice system. So if a bear kind of like transgresses, I was wondering if they were like Antifa. That's why they saw these libertarians show up in their town. So that makes sense. They have a social justice system. That's right. That's right. I don't think that's the social. Uh, I don't know that kind of social. Justice. Sorry, sorry. They're, they're, they're bear warriors. They're, they're, they're social warriors. Um, and then they can like you know, like adopt each other's cubs when there's like a need, but they'll only do that if it's a relative bear. I don't know. Yeah. So they're they're like uh, they're they're wicked smart. They also eat people's faces off. <laughs> and like all the skin off their skull. I guess they're probably trying to eat the whole head, but it just thing. And bear attacks, we always like, yeah, I could hear the grinding of the teeth on my skull. Oh my god! Oh. Sorry, that was. Just, I don't know. I added that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrounded by psychos. This is crazy. <laughs> that just popped out. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, I read a lot of bear attack books in preparation for writing Bear Mageddon, and there's all these stories about how like, like a guy would shoot a bear in the heart, and the bear would still like fight and kill people for like 20 minutes before it died like they'd like look at the bear and find that the, sh- the heart had been shot but it just kept going i don't know how scientific <laughs> that is but uh yeah any of that <laughs> did that ever happen <laughs> <laughs> some of the the historic stories in that region were pretty wicked because you know uh you know the the settlers had you know porpoises guns i suppose and so <laughs> There were always stories of like bears snatching kids and, you know, fathers trying to shoot the bears to, to save them off and it just kind of not working. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, there's stories of bears attack getting the people's gun. Like they'll knock it out yeah. of their hand, they'll bite it and bend it or whatever. They, they grab yeah, the barrel yeah, and yeah. Then turn it. Like, yeah, they get <laughs> bend it like Robocop Bugs <laughs> Bunny or whatever. <laughs> or Robocop. <laughs> <laughs> got time for yet another bear story yeah absolutely yeah. that's what we that's what we brought you on for <laughs> <laughs> well i mean, now i feel kind of like uh inferior because your bear stories all have more serious and dramatic consequences than my bear i have like <laughs> bear uh envy bear story envy mm. i have the <laughs> advantage of that i just made up the whole book <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still still <laughs> <laughs> that does help, I suppose. Um, 
So this woman named uh, uh, Diane Burrington wakes up in the middle of the, uh, or actually it's not the middle of the night. It's like super early morning. Um, and she hears something is after her sheep. And so she jumps out of bed, uh, runs out in her uh, nightgown with a gun in each hand, as one does. <laughs> 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 I'm tracking with you. <laughs> so she hears the sheep screaming out there like, ah! <laughs> I thought she knows something's chasing them. I'm just trying to, and she hears the rustling. Well, yeah, like she didn't know what it was. Yeah, Bear was on the on the menu of possibilities. You have to get two guns out. Yeah, yeah, two guns. Yeah, she, she doesn't mess around. <laughs> um, and she, uh, she goes running out there, uh, and she has like an electrified fence system around her her pasture that's meant to deter bears but somehow this bear has gotten through and it's uh kind of like stampeding her sheep around uh the the barn area and one sheep has gotten tangled up in the fencing Hmm. and so she goes and she starts to uh address that sheep and she's got like, you know, wire clippers handy. So she, she's uh, freeing that sheep so that it doesn't strangle itself. It was bait. What was that? It was bait. It was bait. The yeah. tangled it up in there and was <laughs> waiting <laughs> behind her. It's the classic superhero move. Yeah. A super villain move, right? <laughs> the sheep was the damsel in distress. Um, so no, uh, uh, the bear comes out of the barn and it sees that she's there and armed and, uh, uh, decides, yeah, discretion is a better part of valor, and it just uh, takes off. It starts running away. And so she's like, okay, good. But then she sees that, uh, oh, and I haven't mentioned she has a guard llama. Guard llama? <laughs> and buried the lead there once again. <laughs> <laughs> it shoots lasers from its eyes. <laughs> uh, the llama's name is Hurricane. And uh, it has grown up with a sheep. It thinks that it is a sheep. Okay. Uh, and it's, you know, 300 pound llama. And it typically like kind of acts like a protector of these sheep. And so now when the bear takes off, hurricane, the llama starts chasing the bear across the pasture. <laughs> and oh, the llama's Diane's chasing like, the bear. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Diane's like, oh, donkey. No, yo, if, uh, if you catch the bear, the bear is going to eat you. Gonna win. So she's like, yeah, like hurricane. No. And she starts like chasing after it, but she only has <laughs> two legs. So both the bear and the llama are outpacing her very quickly. Um, and she's, uh, uh, she told me for some reason, like I was like asking her in great detail, like, well, what went through your mind? And she said, I wish I had a third gun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> her arm, but, you know, she's running, chasing the llama and the bear. <laughs> Yosemite Sam Yosemite style. Sam. She's like shoots down at the ground. And, yeah. That'd make her go faster. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, the llama is literally like nipping at the bear as, as they're chasing across uh, the, the uh, dimly lit pasture. And then <laughs> like AK-47 spit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that this is going to be a, a problem because the bear is going to hit the fence uh, at the far end of the pasture and then it's going to have nowhere to go and mm. it's going to have to turn and kill the llama to like defend itself and uh, just as she suspects and you know she, they're like really outpacing her at this point so she's mm. not close enough mm-hmm. to get any kind of a shot off uh, the bear runs into the fence it kind of like bounces off at an angle and the llama's right behind it, so the bear turns and engages with the llama and like launches itself at, at Hurricane. And uh, Diane said, and that's when I got to see everything I had read about llamas. And basically, the llama just started to kick the donkey. Of the bear. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I wish that she had one hand on a video camera yeah. and one hand on a gun. Yeah, <laughs> she, she would have been the YouTube. She would have owned YouTube by now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, the llama starts, uh, whirling around like a dervish, like lashing out of the bear, kicking the bear in the chest, face, head, <laughs> side, <laughs> and the bear doesn't seem to be able to lay a claw on a hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, eventually, uh, after a couple minutes, like before Diane even catches up, um, the bear 
decides that you know uh, th- this is just a bad <laughs> a bad night <laughs> bad enough, <laughs> and it squeezes out through the uh, through the wiring and uh, retreats off into into the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> And lies to his friends about what happened. (laughs) (laughs) Did the sheep do that to you? No. I used to live my, my neighbors, my, one of my best friends growing up had a llama ranch right down from our house. And we like, we camped out there one time and I was making a weird noise, just goop being an idiot, you know? And I had, I had accidentally figured out the noise that llamas make during mating season because this <laughs> llama down below that was in the mood or whatever just started making the exact same noise at me in the dark and the distance. So, like, I'm like going, I think I was like impersonating a giant seagull or something in the context of whatever I was doing. I was like, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like, I hear it. <laughs> and like, you could see a silhouette of this llama going insane down there, like thinking that there's some... I don't know, some rendezvous in the woods that it needed to get to. <laughs> <laughs> we died laughing. That was, that was pretty awesome. Well. I we, wonder if there's uh, gainful employment for a uh, uh, someone who can do a llama mating call. And it feels like that's a yeah. useful skill somehow. He'd be a llama breeder. Yeah, yeah get him going. <laughs> <laughs> he was excited. <laughs> well, do we want to do a subscriber yeah, portion? Yeah, we can do it. Yeah, we, we, we have a, so we do a subscriber portion that's been at a paywall. Uh, we can talk a little more freely and, um, and then we have our 10 questions we ask every guest. All right. Which are often funny because they're geared towards Christian guests. So sometimes they're funny. They just confuse people. <laughs> Though I don't know. We just assumed your faith. We don't know what your position is. We don't know where you come from. Uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, it makes me uncomfortable talking to you guys knowing that you have strong faith. I have no faith. Um, okay. I, I'm, uh, We've had a, uh, we have atheists on people are agnostics. And, yeah. Good, yeah. good, good. Yeah, no, it's all, it's all good. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, are we now in subscriber? Uh, uh, first let's, let's hawk your book. All right. Let's do it. Purchase the book. Everybody. Libertarian, Libertarian walks, into bear, walks into a bear. Yeah. The utopian plot to liberate an American town. And, and some, some bears. bears. <laughs> <laughs> They're trying to liberate the bear? Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, subscribers. Goodbye, goodbye freeloaders. Goodbye, freeloaders. Subscriber portion. Here we go. <laughs> Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. Can I ask you a final question? I'm just curious. Uh, question 11. Is yeah, this is different chat? in the list. Your Twitter bio is intriguing. Oh. Okay. Stock boy to server to business owner to poker player to cabbie to social worker to Pulitzer finalist and award winning journalist. Little newspapers from like the 1800s, they just get hacksaw. (laughs) Enjoying this hard hitting interview? Become a Babylon Bee subscriber to hear the rest of this conversation. Go to BabylonBee.com slash plans for full length ad free podcasts. Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee. 